If you're in the mood to give us a drum roll, this is a good moment for it, because we're launching the fifth, the fifth season of Why Dance Matters, the Royal Academy of Dance podcast. I'm David Jays, and once again, we're cozying up to some pretty wonderful people to hear how dance has helped them on their way. This season, we'll visit Brazil, South Africa and Singapore. We'll hear how RAD Ballet can lead to a career in high finance and how an award-winning actor reimagines their body for Shakespeare or musicals. We'll meet a publisher, a theatre director, a consumer finance champion, a sometime burlesque performer and the new chief executive of the Royal Academy of Dance. And guess what? All of those are the same person. But first, another drum roll if you would, we'll meet one of the world's great ballerinas. Tyler Peck is not only a reigning star at the New York City Ballet, she's also a director and choreographer in her own right. She has an innate musicality, an enviable work ethic, a competitive streak as wide as the Hudson River, and a warmth and enthusiasm that burn off the stage. As well as starring with New York City Ballet, she commissions her own programmes of dance, working with some of the world's greatest and creating ambitious choreography herself. Her new show, Turn It Out with Tyler Peck and Friends is on its way to London. Tyler's speaking from New York today, high on the 15th floor. I can't wait to hear where she's coming from and where she's going. It's already been quite a journey. Tyler, it's a huge pleasure to welcome you to Why Dance Matters. And we are going to talk about you, we're going to talk about your dancing, we're going to talk about your programme of new commissions and your own choreography. There's a lot to get through. But first, we love a pet on Why Dance Matters. A dancer's pet is something we are fascinated by. So you have to tell us about Callie the dog. It was actually Callie's birthday yesterday. Really? Oh, happy birthday yesterday, Callie. <laughs> so she's a Maltese poo, so Maltese poodle mixture. And she just turned 14 and I've had her since she was about eight months. So she's been with me through everything. And oh, oh wow, she's, she's my baby girl. She's amazing. She knows how to do a pirouette. She's <laughs> definitely a dance dog. And she sits through about every company class right by my bar spot. So we should really be talking to her because she will have the gossip. She will have the inside scoop. It's so true. She's seen it all. <laughs> Has she ever watched a performance from the wings or would that be too much? Um, They won't allow that, but she has made it on stage once while I was in rehearsal. Somehow she made it down a flight of stairs and on the stage during a Nutcracker rehearsal. But all of our rehearsal directors love dogs, so I was so scared, but (laughs) she was having a great time with all the girls and flowers. (laughs) Oh, I think they should have kept that in. That would be can. Imagine that working. Yeah. (laughs) So, Tyler, you were born in Bakersfield in California, but you've made your career mostly in New York. Are you now a Manhattan sophisticate? Is that you? Are you still the sunny California girl? I'm definitely still a sunny California girl. I say I've lived in New York longer now, I guess, than California, but I still feel very much like a Californian. But you first discovered dance I think at your mother's dance studio how was that was that just part of life and like Callie you were kind of there in the room while things were happening exactly my mother was a dancer and then she opened a dance studio and both my sister and I were kind of babysat there we're walking into class as soon as we were walking and you know I stuck with it and my sister who was seven and a half years older than me. She went on to play Division One soccer and she said, you know, there was an obvious difference when you were seven and a half years younger, but could 
do what I was doing. And I thought, okay, dance is not my thing. <laughs> so <laughs> it was nice because we both went and had our own routes. You know, I tried to play soccer and that was definitely not my specialty. My mom said I used to like dance down the field and my sister was like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. That <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think you've said before that as a family, you're alarmingly competitive. So I guess it's probably quite good that you and your sister early on discovered that you had totally different fields in which each of you could excel without having to <laughs> combat each other. That's so true. You know, we're very, very close family. And I would say we all have that competitive drive. My father was a division one college football coach. My mom obviously danced and then my sister and then me. So I think that competitive drive came from my mom teaching us if we're going to do something like we do it 110%. Don't waste the spot of somebody that could also be there that really wants to be there. So I think whatever area or avenue we went down, that was how we were brought up. When we play like card games or in games in the backyard or something, it's like the Peck Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, terrifying. <laughs> so does that mean that kind of partners and boyfriends and you know, friends are just sort of sit there on the sidelines, oh my God. appalled? <laughs> I actually love it. And it's only funny because it's just my mom is so good at everything. <laughs> she literally beats us all at everything and it just kind of cracks us up. We never stand a chance against her. <laughs> and what was it like being taught by your parent because you know there's enough tension in the parent-child relationship anyway without necessarily adding the difficulty of, of dance and ballet into the mix were you able to be quite calm with each other yeah I think my mom actually handled it really really well because she was obviously my first teacher you know when I got around six I think she could tell that I you know, when she would ask questions in the in the classroom, like, you know, no one would know the answer, but I'd raise my hand and she wouldn't call on me. And I'd come home and I'd be like, Mom, why didn't you call on me? I knew the answer. And she was like, because I know you know the answer. I need everybody else in the class learning too. And I think she could see that I needed to be around more talented dancers that would help me improve and she kind of just wanted to be my mom and not my mom and my teacher. So she was only my teacher till I was six. And then she found me the best teacher in L.A. and Downey, California. And my grandmother would drive me five days a week, three hours there and three hours back. It's kind of crazy I when I say it out loud, but we did that. <laughs> and, that is and, commitment, though, isn't it? Yeah. Looking back on it, I'm, I'm very close with my grandma. And it's probably because we spent so much time in in the car together but it was like a valuable time i've heard all about her childhood and her life i would just say grandma tell me more stories and i do my homework <laughs> in the car so now i don't like to drive you know but then i didn't really mind it because i was getting to go to dance which is something i loved i loved being with my grandma and i loved school so it wasn't that bad <laughs> <laughs> and when you did start dancing alongside better young dancers. And of course, you've carried on <laughs> through your career, dancing alongside in the same company as incredible classical dancers. For someone who is innately competitive, how was that? Was that a bit of a shock to the system that you weren't automatically the best in the room? No, actually, I feel like that was... It's like what I loved. I loved having people there to make me better, you know, it made me constantly want to just improve. And that's actually why I decided I wanted to be a ballerina because really growing up, I was very strong jazz dancer. I was mostly in a competition studio that did everything. And we had obviously ballet and our technique was very strong at this studio, which allowed me to and try to be in a ballet school. But there was something about it when I went to SAB that I found like it was a challenge. And I liked that. I liked that I wasn't the best at this school. There was something in me that was like, 
I don't want to look like a jazz dancer trying to be a ballerina. I want to learn. I want to put my mind there. And I was like, I'm going to do this. <laughs> That's why I, I loved SAB. I loved the School of American Ballet, the feeding school into New York City Ballet, for those of you who don't know. And I just, from then on, was like, I saw the Nutcracker and I told my dad, Daddy, I want to be on that stage someday when I was like nine years old or 11. Oh, 11. Really? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, that's that's wonderful. And it's because it wasn't immediately easy and immediately comfortable that it gave you something to fight against and test yourself against. I think so. I, I don't know. I don't, I've never really liked putting myself in situations where I could already do it or I was the best at something. Yeah. Like, I don't know. There's, there's no fun in that to me. And that's how I've continued to be in my career and Always surround yourself with people that are better. Same thing with the programs I'm putting together and like ones that I'm bringing to Sadler's. It was always surround myself with the best. <laughs> It'll make me better. And I'm just constantly yearning to learn more. And moving forward a bit rapidly, but as you've mentioned, the program that you're bringing to London. So you joined New York City Ballet, you became a principal, you danced everything old and of course a lot of new work as well but did you always itch to do more to have a bit more creative control was that always there I don't think it was always there I think it has been there in the last maybe seven years or so I got into the company so young I was 15 one I couldn't believe I was in the company <laughs> And do <laughs> is so excited to dance. So I think that that took all of my willpower and, and mindset that I had, and all the room in there. But now, after being principal for a bit, like you mentioned, having the opportunity to dance so many different ballets, I feel like that was when I thought, I really want to use all of this knowledge that I have, and I want to be more creative in creating something. So I think that that's been the last seven, eight years. And everyone I've spoken to and all the interviews I've read about you always say that you're incredibly hardworking, but also a huge amount of fun. And those are not always things that go together <laughs> in classical ballet. <laughs> How do you keep that balance going? It's funny. It's so true. <laughs> You know, I don't know, hardworking. I'm definitely hardworking. I, one of my coaches always says, like, I would take a note from somebody that was just walking on the street. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I laugh because it's like, yeah, I, I take everybody's notes because then I process them and not all of them will I think work for me. But that doesn't mean that I won't listen and see if it does work for me. You know, I've never been somebody who, when they're given a note in the studio, then comes back, well, well, I was doing this because like, that's just not me. I just listen to it and then think about it and think about, okay, I understand what they're saying. And maybe this is a way or, you know, I understand, but that that's not what I want to do in this moment. So I am extremely hardworking. I'm never happy with, I'm happy, but I'm never finished. If that makes sense. Like right. I love the dancer that I am at the moment, but there's always room to get better. That's how I've always been. And I am definitely the hardest critic on myself. <laughs> it's a good way, though. It's not something that puts me in like a serious depressive state. It's in a way that is a healthy way, I think, to continue improving. And for keeping it fun and light, I think that's just from working with a lot of different choreographers over the years and knowing who I who I like to work with. And, you know, I just think you get more out of the person in the room if you're doing the work, but there's also got to be love and fun because if somebody's terrified of you or just this is about the work, like, where is the dance? I think dance is so much more than just the technical steps. So to me, you have to bring a little bit of of sun and light into the room so that you can get like the full presence of the person. Yeah. And despite being your own most severe critic, can you also come off stage after a performance radiant with joy and a real sense of satisfaction? 
Yes, I can say I can. I can always say that I'll probably be like, ah, I could have done that better. But there have been definitely times where this season I did an Allegro Brilliant and I came off stage and I was like, that was so much fun. Like I was so pleased <laughs> and I just had the best time with my partner out there. So yes, I can say that I do allow myself to have fun and be excited after a performance. <laughs> <laughs> I had to push you to get you over <laughs> that line and to say that in public, but I'm glad because <laughs> you know audience has have a great time watching you. It's it's nice to think that you're sharing the joy as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In 2019, you had a really severe injury, a neck injury that for a time seemed as if you might not be able to dance again, might not even be able to walk again. When you're used to listening to your body as a dancer and paying it such close attention and knowing what it's saying to you, suddenly to not know quite what was going on must have been terrifying. Yes, that is definitely one thing I feel like I'm not good at. As dancers, we're used to being told this is where you go and this is the count. And we're just used to having like a goal and then like knowing where and how to get there. With this injury, it was very in the unknown. That was really hard for me. Like, I think, and for those of you who don't know, I suffered a really bad herniated disc in my neck. There was a lot of different things that made this really difficult because it not only was just like a herniated disc, but it was touching my spinal cord, which was affecting my fingers. And it was a very traumatic injury that actually I just woke up one morning and couldn't really move my head without so much pain. There wasn't a moment on stage where I felt it which was, I think, the scarier part of it. I always just kept saying, you know, if they told me like, okay, you're going to have to be out even if it was like two years, but you'll be back. I could have had like a time frame and that would have been easier for me. But to hear like, oh, you're probably never going to dance again. Or, you know, we don't know if this is going to heal or you need to get surgery. There's no way you can ever walk again without the surgery. Like that was really hard. I mean, I went to six seven different doctors and it was almost like a mind game because it was just nobody really knew any answers and that was the hardest part for me I think. And as a dancer of course so much of your identity is bound up in what you do how you perform and all of those things it must be hard to hold on to a sense of yourself. Of course because I feel my best when I am dancing. So it felt like a huge part of my being was like missing. You know, that was really, really hard for me. I, of course, am so lucky to have many things in my life, family, Callie, a boyfriend that I love very much. But, you know, without dance, that's like a huge kind of hole in me. And I think you created thousandth orange which is one of the works you're bringing to london and which is a big choreography of your own during that time when you couldn't dance and there's a lot going on there how was that process it's funny because so damien watzel asked me to make that piece for the veil vale dance festival i had made either one or two other works for him the previous years i said to him you know I don't know if I'm going to be able to make something because normally I, I do the movements on myself. I hear the music and I feel what I want to do. And how am I going to do that when I can't move? He said, well, why don't you use this like as a lesson and see, you know, just get in the studio, try it out. If it doesn't work and nothing is coming to you and you get the dancers in front of you and you're not able to to do it, then we'll just, we'll just nix it. But why don't you try? And I remember talking to... Bill, I call him Bill, but William Forsyth about it. And he was like, that's when you know if you can really choreograph. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So, you know, I tried it and I actually, it was much, it was a much different process than anything I'd ever done before because I really had to 
focus more on the dancer's body instead of using my own. I couldn't lift my arm, both of my arms. I wasn't supposed to. So it was definitely a very different experience. But I really love what ended up coming out of it. And The Thousandth Orange, it's a piece with a score by Caroline Shaw, which I think is inspired by still life painting and the idea that you paint something again and and again and again and the thousandth orange you paint still has to be as beautiful and exciting to you as the first one. And for you, as a choreographer, you have danced so many amazing classic roles. You have created so many new roles with living choreographers. There are, I guess, as it were, a lot of oranges in your head and in your imagination. How did you stay true to your vision and not let all those different voices crowd in? I don't know. I think that I I listened actually to Caroline Shaw. She was speaking at Juilliard, actually, and I went to see her seminar and she played, or some students at Juilliard played Thousandth Orange and she spoke about it and the way she spoke about why she wrote the piece I don't know right there I sat there I was like okay this is the piece of music I want to use if I hadn't heard her talk about the music I'm not sure I would have loved it as much but to hear her to go in depth like you were saying about how when you peel an orange and how they're so intricate and how the thousandth is just as special as the first one and different and interesting. And that's kind of how I picked the dancers. It was like some of the dancers I most admire and love to watch and how I feel like each one of them is just as special and better and different Mm -hmm. as the other one. And so in my head, I thought, okay, we're going to make our own little orange tree. And that's like, there's a tableau (laughs) in the beginning and one that keeps coming back. And that was kind of my inspiration for the piece. There's no story to it, but it's just about having that unified like foundation and coming back to it. And it does sound as if there's a sense of community there. Is that part of the appeal for you of either being part of a big ballet company like New York City Ballet or creating your own company for these sorts of programs where you're producing them? Oh, definitely. All the dancers always say that it's not work when the group is together because we all love each other so much. And I will say that I don't care how talented a dancer is, if they are not a nice human being and somebody pleasant (laughs) to work with, like they are not a part of this group. And that's (laughs) kind of, I think, what makes it so special because there's not many groups where you can do that, where you can go and like every single person. That's just not really possible. But I really feel in this program that that's how it is. And everybody is so excited when another date gets set and we get to do it again somewhere and be together. We're not all in the New York City Ballet, so it's not like we're all seeing each other every single day. Most of us are, but there's a handful that we don't get to be together. So it's like the best friends tour ever. And not only are you not all in New York City Ballet, of course, some of you aren't classical ballet performers. And um, Time Spell, which is also on the programme, is a piece that you made with the amazing tap genius, Michelle Dorrance, and Gillian Myers, who has an amazing range of experience from commercial dance all the way through to tap. So people who come at dance from different directions We always say that thing, that dance is a universal language. But were you easily speaking the same language when you were in the studio together? You know, we actually, I think, didn't really talk the same language, which I think was why it made for a very interesting piece. I think that it started with the music. I'll say that, that we all wanted to pick the structure of the music first. You know, it's not a story, but it needed to flow in a sense that it made an arc. 
So that was definitely like the first thing we did was listen to a lot of pieces of music that were composed by Penelope, who will be on stage as one of the singers, put that into a little sort of arc that we could then build upon. And if one of us leaned towards that piece of music, instantly Jillian really liked this one section. She was like, I think I'm really kind of being called to this part. And we said, okay, take it. And we call that part sirens. And it's one of my favorite parts. And so that's kind of how we spread it out. And obviously we were involved in each section, but I think one person really outlined that section and then we worked within it. And it was also a big collaborative experience with the dancers in the room. Yes, we were directing like, okay, this is this amount of eights we're going to do and this and let's create this together or let's have this idea and let's come up with some imp- improv. So it wasn't like any other process I had danced or, or choreographed before, but it was so much fun. And I guess there's a sort of old school model of choreography, which is the great choreographer, probably a man, giving pronouncements from, from a high place and dancers obeying. And hopefully that's not so much your experience now. Is it easy to have those fierce conversations or ask difficult questions as a dancer as well as as a co-choreographer? Hmm. I, I don't know how to to answer that in a way. I think that I don't really feel like I've ever really had or been scared to say something. I think, you know, when I was younger dancing, of course, I was more shy and I wanted to just kind of please the person in the front of the room, whoever that was. And then you get to a point when you're dancing where you stop wanting to please as much, meaning like, yes, you still want to make your coach happy, but the performance becomes more about pleasing yourself, being happy with yourself and the performance you did. And you start to learn that they're there to help you become the best version of, of yourself. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So they're there along the the road kind of. And then when you get on stage, you just have to be in the moment. And I think that that translates to how maybe I run a room and how I want to run a room. And so when I am in the front directing or choreographing or whatever it is, I try to do those things. I, I'm not afraid to use my voice. I know how to get what I want, but do it in a way that makes the room feel very loved and that I'm approachable. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is I, I want to be approachable and like anybody can come up and ask me or tell me a problem or this isn't working or can we try this? Like, I definitely don't want to be somebody that would ever be like, oh, you can't talk to her. <laughs> the other thing, of course, about what you're doing now when you're curating programs and directing and choreographing is that the buck stops with you. There must be lots of decisions and ultimately they're yours. Is that a satisfaction as well as a challenge? I think that was a great way to put it. Yeah, it is a satisfaction and a challenge. I know when they ask me, you know, like, what would you like for the musicians to wear or something. I'm like, wait, that that should be not something I'm doing. <laughs> so sometimes it makes me laugh, you know, um, at what they're asking me. I'm like, oh, I, I didn't think I was going to have to, to deal with that. But I think artistically, I love it. I love getting to be creative and put together something that feels very fulfilling as an artist, but also something that will be fulfilling to the audience. And getting to be in charge instead of having to always dance things that were chosen for me or, you know, I I get to put the rep together. I get to put the dancers that I want the audience to see together. That is very satisfying. And you get to share the stage with these artists. They're the ones I want to surround myself with. Like I was saying earlier, you know, like surround yourself with the best. And also on the programme, you're dancing what looks like a really beautiful duet, Swift Arrow by Alonzo King. And there is one piece that London audiences may have seen online, which is The Bar Project by, you've already mentioned him, William Forsyth. 
set to music by James Blake. And that was one of those most innovative lockdown projects, which came together, I guess, initially with you all working separately over Zoom because you couldn't be in the same room. How how was all of that? Because what a strange experience that must have been. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when I like think of it right now. I was never in the same room with Bill. Never, ever. ever. Oh, my goodness. Ever. <laughs> Neither were the three men. We were in the room, obviously, because <laughs> we had to film it together. But the four of us were really only together for two days before we filmed it. And yeah, it was it was kind of during the lockdown, I I hit a point where I was missing being creative. And I thought, gosh, this is just feels like a lot of time is being lost. And I'm definitely not like that. I didn't know what to do with myself, you know, so I texted Bill and I was like, Bill, okay, I know we've tried to work together a few times and our schedule never works. I had plane tickets to Vermont and I was going to go work with him. And then I one time got the oh, flu no. so bad that he got like, literally, it was like all of these obstacles kept making us not be able to work together. And it was so upsetting to both of us. Ever since I got into the company, I don't know, like my director asked me who was the person you wanted to work with most. And I said, William Forsythe. So I don't know what it was, but I just really, really wanted to work with him. And I texted him and I said, so I know it's not ideal, but like, would you want to make something, you know, now? And he wrote back right away and said, well, when would you want to start? <laughs> And I wrote that, oh, like anytime, whatever works for you. And he wrote tomorrow with a question mark. <laughs> and I was like, yes. <laughs> we didn't even know what we were going to do. I mean, I, I, I just knew I wanted to work with him. I didn't know if it was going to become anything. I just wanted to get in the room. I wanted to be created on. I wanted to just have a process with him. And we spent every day together, really, besides like weekends for I would say like almost two or three months. It was one of the best times of my life. I'll never forget it. We didn't have an organization at all behind it. So it was just me and him for wanting to work together. And there were no rules. You know, it wasn't like, okay, you can only work six hours and you have to do this at this time. It was whatever we wanted each day. You know, some days it was oh, I need to go because I need to go on a walk with my wife, he would say. When I, or, and I'd be like, I need to be with my grandmother. This, well, it was just really enjoyable. And I wish I could put the time in like a capsule. But it's pretty, it's pretty ingrained in my head. So I think I'll remember it forever. <laughs> yes, I can imagine that sticking a bit. And now when you're taking the work onto an actual stage with an audience, does that change it? Does it feel different? doing it for a live audience rather than just for the camera? Yeah, the first time we performed it, I mean, granted, you know, we could stop whenever we wanted for the filming. I mean, Buzzard, we did in one take. We literally, it was the first thing we filmed. That's the first part of Bar Project. And it was the first thing of the day. And we did one take and Bill was like, okay, that was it. And we were like, what? <laughs> And I remember the director is being like, you don't want another one just in case, you know, heaven forbid this like get lost or something. He was like, no, that was it. Oh. So I think already when we were filming it, we were already feeling like we were performing it. So it didn't change that much, but it was really nice to hear the audience excitement because I think a lot of people had seen the digital yes. premiere. And so they were waiting for it and we could feel it in those moments and it also you know was just it's exhausting <laughs> you know <laughs> to run it back to back without having breaks for the filming it, it was tough but it's so worth it and after the last few years after injury after lockdowns to be performing back in theaters with full enthusiastic audiences it must give you goosebumps to to be back on stage like that it's still sometimes i think hard to to believe that we were without it for so long and 
there's just definitely that dancer audience relationship that was missing for so long. And that is just, it's what makes it feel like a live performance. They're with you every step of the way, you know, watching it in real time. And there's an excitement with that that I think you can't get without them. And so, yeah, I'm just so grateful to be back able to dance, back dancing with colleagues, not just in my mother's <laughs> kitchen. Can't take it for granted anymore, that's for sure. Absolutely. Tyler, it has just been such a pleasure. But there is one final question, which is, why does dance matter to you? Dance matters to me because I truly believe that it's healing. I think since my injury, I know that it is healing to me. I know that it's always been the way I sort of express myself. It was a way to get my emotions out. But I also believe that it's healing for those that are watching because I think it has the ability to kind of transport them to a different place for that one moment in time when they're watching. Tyler, that is a beautiful place to end the conversation. Thank you so much for your time. It has been a huge pleasure and a privilege to talk to you. Thank you. Yes, I loved it. <laughs> Tyler has more than a bushel and a peck of vitality. As we said, I'd read a lot about how she combines fearsome hard work with an infectious sense of fun. And I certainly got that from our chat. It's a shot in the arm, and I hope you felt it too. The evening that Tyler has curated heard it out with Tyler Peck and friends is at Sadler's Wells in London from the 9th to the 11th of March. Details of that are in our show notes, as are the RAD's Sociable Socials. I'm at Mr. David J's on Twitter, and I'd love to know if there's anyone else you'd like to hear on Why Dance Matters. And do subscribe, like, or review the podcast so that more people can find Why Dance Matters. Our guest today was Tyler Peck. Why Dance Matters is made by the RAD team of Neve Carey Furness and Katie Hagen, and our artwork is by Bex Glendening. And no one will be happier that we heard about Tyler's dog, Callie, happy birthday again, Callie, than our producer, Sarah Miles. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon. <laughs>